I'd like to complete the enzyme inhibition and mechanisms talk. I'm talking about proteases and variation in how their reactions take place. So the prototypical enzyme we'll talk about is a serine protease, and the example we'll use is chymotrypsin. So all serine proteases share some things in common. They are proteases. They digest other proteins right, and cleave the certain peptide bonds. They share features in their active sites. A serine is clearly involved, as the name implies. And they have a similar overall shape. Their primary, secondary, and tertiary structures, while not exactly the same, are very similar. So they have a, a similar backbone. Some amino acids are changed here and there, of course, but three in particular are always conserved. There's an aspartate, a histidine, and a serine. And we're going to call that the catalytic triad. And they do have some other differences in their amino acid sequences. And when you fold them up into the tertiary structure, there are some differences in the area where the substrate binds, the substrate being another protein, the protein it plans to digest. Okay, so we'll talk about the slight differences in them first and then how they're conserved in their mechanism. And so here's three examples. We have chymotrypsin, trypsin, and elastase. And while all three do the exact same chemistry, they end up using a water molecule to hydrolyze a peptide bond, right? so these are hydrolases, they go about being very selective about which peptide bond they cleave. And how do they do that? They take advantage of the protein, the target protein's sequence. So just before the peptide bond that gets cleaved, there is an amino acid, of course, and depending on what that amino acid is, it's selected for or selected against by these three enzymes. For example, chymotrypsin likes to cleave the peptide bond immediately after a bulky residue, such as this tyrosine in the example shown in A here. Trypsin cleaves immediately after a basic residue, like arginine or lysine. And finally, elastase on the end cleaves after some small uncharged side chain. The example shown here is alanine. How does the enzyme detect these amino acids? Well, in the first case, the tyrosine is checked by a very deep, wide pocket, right? That's this little blue area of the enzyme here, right? And at the bottom of this deep pocket is an uncharged serine, so a polar serine that could hydrogen bond with the tyrosine. In the second case, the arginine that's detected in trypsin's pocket is done so by interacting with an aspartate. All right, so we have an ionic interaction here. And in the case of elastase, the pocket is very shallow and very hydrophobic, where the methyl groups of valine and threonine form a pocket that interacts with the methyl group of alanine. Okay, all three of these pockets select for which peptide bond, based on the amino acid that precedes it, is going to get cleaved. We call this pocket the specificity pocket. It's not like the active site, it's near the active site, and it's used to help this enzyme select for which peptide bond it will cleave. All right, so the strategy here that we're going to employ, in fact, there's two strategies here. We're going to do an acid-base catalysis, and we're going to do covalent catalysis. So the enzyme is going to donate and remove protons, and it's also going to get involved in the chemistry. It's going to make some covalent bonds to substrates at some point. And the part that all three of these, in fact, all serine proteases have in common is the said a catalytic triad. There's an aspartate, a histidine, and a serine that are going to work in unison to accomplish the chemistry. Okay, so at the bottom here, we have our aspartate. It happens to be aspartate 102 in this organism, and histidine 57 and serine 195. You notice they're not next to each other in the sequence, in the primary structure, but they do end up next to each other in the tertiary structure in three-dimensional space. Okay, so what I want you to get out of this is not necessarily memorizing these numbers because they change from species to species and from serine protease to different serine protease. However, you will have an aspartate, a histidine, and a serine in three-dimensional space that are next to one another. And what this accomplishes 
is a chain of events. So the aspartate, being deprotonated at the physiological pH, will tug on the histidine's hydrogen, right? So you have this interaction here. It's not quite deprotonating the histidine, but it's pulling on this hydrogen in this hydrogen bond, right? which gives the histidine impetus to pull on the serine's proton and eventually deprotonate the serine. Now, we remember from our previous lectures that serine, being an alcohol group, has a pKa in isolation somewhere around 16. So it's very unlikely to deprotonate. However, with the aspartate and the histidine nearby and the geometries that are aligned here, that are aligned here it allows us to deprotonate our serine. Now, is this favorable? No, not at all. Right? It still will rather put the, hist the proton back on the serine and stay as an uncharged histidine. But it only has to occur fleetingly. And when this happens, and we do get an alkoxide form, no matter how briefly, it's just enough time for it to attack, nucleophilic attack, a carbonyl of our substrate. And that's what's shown at the top. If we deprotonate this alcohol, our being our serine, it can attack the carbonyl of our peptide bond, of our substrate protein, right? And eventually we will break the bond of our peptide bond. It just happens to be a nitrogen in our case, this X. And that is free to leave, and our enzyme is now attached to our peptide, right, through this ester bond. Well, water can cleave an ester bond, so we'll have a water molecule come in and break this ester, cleaving off the latter half of our substrate. And so we've taken our initial protein and cut it into two pieces. First piece leaving here, shown as XH, whatever X might be in our case, it's a, an amide. Right? And in this latter piece, the carboxyl leaving. Right? So this is the latter half of the protein and the former half of the protein leaving. And let's look at the mechanism step by step and see how it works. It's actually eight total steps, but if you think about it, as we go through it, it's going to be four steps that then repeat themselves for a total of eight. Okay, so let's start at the beginning, right here on the middle left of the screen. The thing in yellow represents our protein, our enzyme, right, our, our chymotrypsin. And here's our catalytic triad, the aspartate, the histidine, and the serine, in the most stable arrangement. Okay. Our substrate then binds, that's going to be step one here. So the substrate binds, and it positions itself such that the carbonyl and the amino group that surround the peptide bond are positioned immediately next to this serine. How do we know it's put there? That depends on that specificity pocket again. It's positioned, not shown in this figure, but it positions this carbonyl near the serine. Okay, so our catalytic triad in step two does its arrangements. So the aspartate tugs on the histidine, which deprotonates the serine. And the serine catalytically attacks or, or forms a covalent bond with the carbonyl. Well, this carbon has four bonds already. We can't have five. So when we attack the carbonyl, this nucleophilic attack, this forms an O minus or an, an oxy anion. Okay, so the serine is now bonded to this carbon, and we form an oxy anion. This carbon is now a tetrahedral intermediate, and that's shown in this middle figure. And so our aspartate still attracted to the histidine here, which has deprotonated our serine. That's why it has a positive charge now. And our serine, as an oxygen, is attached to our carbon of our peptide substrate. The oxygen has gained a negative charge from an extra lone pair, and the enzyme, remember enzymes often lower that activation energy or stabilize the intermediate. Here's our intermediate, that oxy anion is not very stable, but the enzyme provides an oxy anion hole, which is always there, but it's now occupied by an oxy anion. Right? It's being stabilized by some interactions here. We'll see that on the next slide. But this intermediate isn't so unstable as it used to be in the absence of the enzyme. That's why this reaction proceeds. Of course, eventually the, the carbonyl collapses, right? And I'm gonna break one of the other three bonds to the carbon. The most likely bond to break would be to the oxygen, right? And I'm back where I started with the serine and the peptide bond. Okay, so this is climbing the hill, forming that unstable intermediate, if you remember the diagram, and then rolling right back down the hill if you break this bond. And that happens often. Occasionally, what will happen is when the carbonyl collapses, instead of breaking the 
carbon oxygen bond, which is the most labile of the bonds, we could break the carbon nitrogen bond. We're very unlikely to break the carbon carbon bond over here. So the carbon nitrogen bond breaks at this time. So then we have an ester, right? This is the, the former half of the peptide chain, and this is the latter half of the peptide chain. I know it's running right to left. We usually see it the other way, but this is the first amino acid or the, in our sequence here. It may be more ahead of it. And the next amino acid listed is R2. So this is the beginning part of the protein and then the later part of the protein. So we break this bond, right? The histidine then donates a proton back to this nitrogen. So from one nitrogen to another, it's a rather free transfer, okay? And then this piece is only loosely associated with this enzyme now. It's only hydrogen bonding with the histidine shown on the right over here. So it is free to leave. However, the amino half of the peptide substrate, which is attached now through its carboxy end, is attached through an ester linkage right here. Okay, so the peptide bond has been broken. The carboxy half of the protein, I know it looks like an amino group because that's the beginning of the carboxy half of the protein, is free to leave. And the amino or beginning half of the protein is attached through its tail, the carboxy end, to the serine. Okay, so now I have my acyl enzyme attachment, right? This is a covalent bond. The enzyme is now covalently attached to part of its substrate. Part of it is leaving, so this is free to go. It's free to go. And now I have my carboxy attachment here. So I need to remove it so I can regenerate this enzyme. So this is where the second substrate, in this case a water molecule, shows up. And it comes and sits right where the serine used to be. Right? So this is moved a little bit. It flexes a little. This, the oxygen has moved a little farther away. And a water molecule comes and sits where the serine used to be. As the water molecule sits there, water having a pKa of around 7, in this case is so much easier to deprotonate than serine was. So our aspartate and histidine deprotonate the water molecule, leaving a hydroxide. The hydroxide, much like the serine did in the first step, or in the uh, second step, attacks the very same carbonyl. This time it's an ester bond, and it goes up and forms an O minus oxyanion one more time. So once again, the very same oxyanion hole is now occupied again with an oxyanion and a tetrahedral carbon, right? stabilizing the second intermediate here. So if you imagine this, this diagram of reaction progress, we've reached a second hump that we must get across. It's not as high as the first one, but it's a second hump. And the enzyme is stabilizing that, making it not such a high hump to cross. And eventually this O minus will collapse back into a carbonyl. And again, we have three bonds to choose from to break. We could break the one to the water molecule and we're right back where we started here. That happens often. It's very unlikely to break the carbon carbon bond again, or we could break the other carbon oxygen bond. And if we break the other carbon oxygen bond, we freed this piece from the serine. And as we break it, this O minus generated on the serine We'll grab the proton from the histidine one more time and become a protonated serine. And the rest of the molecule is free to leave. This is the amino half of the protein, right? Now has been broken off from the serine and is free to go. So if you follow this through one more time, a little quicker this time, you'll see that this is double displacement. What's happening is the first substrate, the peptide or the protein binds, part of itself gets attached to the enzyme and part of itself leaves. So this is the person sitting on the bus and dropping off a suitcase, suitcase being attached to the bus and that person leaving. A second substrate in the second half reaction shows up, in this case water is the second substrate, comes along, picks up that suitcase or the protein piece that was left behind and leaves with it. Right? This is the classic double displacement mechanism. Right? Here's that oxyanion hole. It's always there, but it's not occupied all the time. So when, it, when you have your attack on that carbonyl, either in the, the first half of the reaction or the second half of the reaction, you form the oxyanion intermediate. It is stabilized by this oxyanion hole, which is made by some backbone amides of the enzyme. So we have some NHs in the backbone 
from some glycines and serines that form hydrogen bonding with this O minus to stabilize it. Okay? If these were not here, this O minus would have a much higher energy to, to achieve to, for it to exist, and we would not be reducing the activation energy. So that's what these are doing. So in summary, this includes a covalent catalysis, where the enzyme is covalently attached to the substrate at some point. It includes some general acid-base catalysis because we're donating and, and accepting protons. And it's a double displacement mechanism, right? Where the first substrate is the peptide, and the second substrate is a water molecule that comes and picks up the remaining piece. There are other classes of proteases besides serine proteases. There are cysteine proteases, which work much in the same way, where the serine is replaced by a cysteine. And as you can imagine, the cysteine is much easier to deprotonate than the serine was. So instead of having the aspartate and the histidine and the serine, we have just a histidine, which is able to deprotonate the serine and continue the attack. Water, again, would be our second substrate, and everything would proceed as, as before. An example of that is the papain enzyme shown here. Right, another type is an aspartyl protease. Right, it uses a pair of aspartates, and which you remember, they're in slightly different microenvironments, so their pKa's are ever so slightly different. So one of them will be deprotonated, the one on the left here, and one will be protonated, the one on the right. One will serve as a, a general base, and one will serve to stabilize that oxyanion. So here we have our a deprotonated aspartate on the left, deprotonating a water molecule. The water molecule attacks the ester, or in our case of a protein, an amide bond, but it attacks the carbonyl, right? The O minus, the, the tetrahedral carbon with an oxyanion will be stabilized by the protonated aspartic acid, right? Once again, this will collapse, and when it does, the water molecule actually leaves with the other part of the protein. So there's no intermediate here where it's covalently attached to the enzyme, so this is not double displacement. Right? Whereas in the cysteine and serine proteases, it was double displacement. There's no attachment to the enzyme here. Renin is an example of that. Right? In the third case, again, not covalent attachment here, we have some general base deprotonating a water molecule. Right? This base is some amino acid in the protein, right? in the enzyme. Deprotonated water molecule, the water molecule has been stabilized by some metal ion, which is coordinated by the enzyme again. Right, that's one of your cofactors there. The water attacks the carbonyl, again forming an O minus, collapsing back to a carbonyl, and breaking the peptide bond. Right, all happening again without a covalent attachment to the enzyme. Right, Thermolysin is an example of that. 